hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about today is transistors and in particular high power applications with transistors. So normally if you need a lot of power you choose a high power transistor and if it's not enough you choose a higher power transistor and it that still is not enough, then you go for an even bigger transistor. But at some point, there is no bigger transistor. Or if there is, it's restrictively expensive. So what can you do? Well, one of the things is to take multiple transistors and drive them all in parallel. This helps to spread out the current over all of the transistors, but also the dissipated power. But as always, there is a way in which you can get all the power and currents uniformly distributed and there are ways in which this doesn't work at all. So what I want to do today is look at what are the ways in which you can drive multiple transistors in parallel, how to get this thing to work and what to look for when it doesn't work. So if you're curious then keep watching. So. How complicated can it be? I mean, the easiest way to do it is to simply interconnect all the collectors, all the emitters and all the bases, and then run the transistors like that. But if you do any sort of research, everybody will tell you that that is the absolute possible worst way you can do it. Well, why? Let's try to find out. So if I simulate this sort of circuit with all the transistors interconnected so all the pins are nicely short circuited in between and I run this so I applied a certain voltage pulse and this leads to a certain current going through the circuit and if I look into the collector of each of the three transistors all the currents are equal so the currents are perfectly distributed through the three transistors so the simulation says that this should be perfect let's try it out see what happens and for that I will be building this circuit. So all the bases and the emitters are interconnected, but for the collectors I've placed separate resistors to be able to measure the current going through them. So I will be using individual voltmeters to measure the voltage drop on each of these collector resistors so that we can see exactly what the current is. And based on the simulation, well we expect the exact same current going through all of them for a set supply voltage. So all the bases are interconnected and then collected to the positive terminal through a resistor. Let's see what happens. So I got the setup going. I have four transistors and in their collectors there's a single 10 ohm resistor and then there's a voltmeter connected on top of all of these resistors. So now if we fire the circuit up and we just freeze this for a second, we can see that all of the currents on the four voltmeters are roughly the same. So one of the things that the collector current will depend on is the base emitter voltage, which is the same for all the transistors, and some constructive constants. So even though all four of my transistors are from the same manufacturer, from the same reel, or the same transistor, there are certain differences between them. You can't make identical transistors. Now. Another interesting thing happens. After a while, we can see that the currents start to spread out quite a lot. So we can see one of the transistors running at more than 100 milliamps, whereas one of them is running at only 27. So another factor that comes into play to decide what sort of current goes through the transistor is the temperature at which the transistor is running. So based on the initial discrepancies between the collector currents, the transistors heat up in a different manner and then the current starts changing and then they heat up more. So the transistors with the higher current heat up more than the transistors with the smaller current and we get into a positive feedback loop. And it results in something like this, which even if you use some sort of heatsink to try to equalize the temperature on the transistors, will lead to the transistors breaking. So we need some form of negative feedback, something that will counteract the effect of the current rising based on the transistor's temperature. Now, 
the first thing that we need to address is that in real life we have certain differences between transistors, whereas in the simulation all of the transistors behaved in exactly the same way. And the reason for that is that the simulator actually uses perfectly identical transistors. There's no temperature difference between the transistors and there's no parameter difference between the transistors found in the simulation. So one of the things we can do, just for the purpose of today's experiment, is to use slightly different transistors and then try to match up the currents on those. So rather than going with the same transistor model, I've added a BCP68 transistor model and if we run the simulation like this, we do see certain current differences between the two. So with this circuit, we get about 60 milliamps of current difference. So I will be using these two transistors from now on in the simulation just to assess how the various methods to balance the two currents will work. So the first thing that we can do is the so-called emitter ballast resistor. Basically, this is a resistor added to the emitter of the transistors. So if you have more than two, then each of the transistors gets their own resistor. And the way in which you work out the value of the resistor is so that you get about three to 500 millivolts of voltage drop on them at your maximum current. Now, these resistors will work as a negative feedback loop because the more current goes through the transistor, the larger the voltage drop on that resistor Therefore, the less voltage is available to drive the transistor. So if we try out this circuit where we have 3 ohms and we compare it to our reference, so initially we had 144 milliamps and 84, by using 3 ohm resistors, we get our current difference down to about 9 milliamps. If we go with larger resistors, so we get a larger voltage drop on them and we zoom in a bit, we can see that it's working even better. So we had 108 and 101 for the 3 ohm resistors, and now we get 98 and 102 for the 5 ohm resistors. So the larger the voltage drop, the better the two currents will be balanced. Let's try it out on our practical board with our previous transistors. So I got the exact same board as before, the only difference is I added 4.7 ohm resistors in each of the transistors emitter, but the transistors themselves are exactly the ones that we had before. So now if I run this thing, I increase the voltage a bit, and we look at our initial current, we can see that it's almost perfectly identical. So all of the transistors are running at the same current through them. Now, if we let the circuit run for a while, so let the transistors warm up, we can see that still they're very well matched. So we're barely getting one or two milliamps of current difference between the transistors, but other than that, even as the transistors heat up, the resistors are providing proper negative feedback, keeping all the transistors nice and balanced. Now it's worth mentioning that if you want to apply this technique for bipolar transistors, you will need to calculate your resistor so that the voltage drop on them is around 3 to 500 millivolts. But if you want to use field effect transistors, then because of the way the threshold voltage can have a large spread for those transistors, there you will need to drop up to a couple volts to get all the transistors properly matched. So even after about five minutes, the transistors heated up, we can see this in the increased collector current, but we can still see that the currents are properly balanced. So we barely have more than one milliamp of current difference between the four transistors. Now the next thing we can do is amplify the feedback that we're getting from our emitter resistor. And we can accomplish that by adding another transistor. So basically what I did here was first of all split up the base circuit so we have individual resistors driving each of the transistors by themselves. And I added this extra transistor over the emitter resistor to provide an active emitter ballast circuit. And now this has a couple advantages. So on the one side, we no longer care what the power transistor is. So if it's a bipolar or field effect transistor, 
we only need to drop enough voltage on the emitter resistor to drive our second transistor. The second transistor needs to be something that's low power, so the only current it needs to be able to handle is the current that normally goes into the base of the high power transistor. And other than helping with spreading out the currents over multiple transistors, this extra transistor works like an active current limit. So no matter what you do, you will not be able to drive any current you want through the circuit. Once you've driven the small transistor with enough voltage, it will limit whatever is going into the base of the high power transistor. So even if you short circuit your high power output stage, this will provide protection. So if we run this thing and compare it to our previous circuit, so previously we had around 4 milliamps between the two transistors, and now we barely have 1 milliamp. So this is supposed to help even more with equalizing the currents. But as always, this will work only as well as the two little transistors are matched. So this again is not perfect, but it's a step forward. Now there's one more thing that's worth mentioning regarding the circuit, and that is that other than amplifying the negative feedback so the voltage found on the resistor, this second transistor adds another layer of protection in the sense that the voltage it needs to be driven is again temperature dependent. So the hotter one of these transistors gets, the less voltage it will need to be driven. So your current limit is temperature dependent. The hotter the power transistor gets, the lower the maximum current that you will be allowing through it. So let's try the circuit out, see how it works with our transistors. So I made the necessary circuit updates. There's individual resistors in each of the transistors bases, and there's the extra feedback transistor added. And now if we turn on the circuit, we have our initial currents nicely balanced, so somewhere between 118 milliamps and 116. And now if we let the circuit run for a while, first of all, we can see that the major contributor now is the small transistor rather than the large transistor. And we can see that the currents are decreasing rather than increasing as the circuit heats up. And another thing we can see, if I start to play around with the supply voltage, so the higher this voltage is, the higher the current should be going through the circuit. But we can see that it kind of stabilizes. So it, at around 120 milliamps, it stops. So we get our active current limit. And if I let the circuit run for a while, we can see that the currents stay roughly equal. They're not perfectly equal because of the parameter spread with the small transistors this time. So rather than the evenness of the currents through the transistors being dictated by the large power transistor, now it's dictated by the small transistor. But anyway, even if the currents start to be different between transistors, none of them will exceed the maximum current limit set by the emitter resistor value and the small transistor. Now, there's only one problem with this circuit. I mean, it works, that's, that's not the problem. Problem is that on your emitter resistor, you need to drop around 5, 6, 700 millivolts to be able to drive the small transistor. And if your circuit is running at 10, 20, 100 amperes, 600 millivolts will cause a lot of power dissipation. So although it works, it's not a very power efficient method. If only there were some way to decrease the voltage needed to drive the small transistor. And one way to do that looks something like this. So based on the circuit we previously used, what I did differently was interconnect the emitters of the two small transistors and supply these through a current sink. Now to stabilize the voltage we're getting in reference to ground, I added this Schottky diode. And what makes the Schottky diode special compared to a regular PN junction diode is that the forward voltage is roughly 0.1 up to 0.34 depending on the diode. So basically what I added 
was a voltage offset dictated by this diode that is subtracted from our emitter resistor. So if we run the two circuits, we see our initial circuit operating, so I'm applying a pulse voltage this time, and we can see as slowly the overcurrent protection kicks in, and with the other circuit, we see basically the same phenomenon. So the slope isn't exactly the same, but we still get the same overcurrent protection effect. And we can see that the voltage on the small resistor now only increases to about 200 millivolts because the rest is on our stabilization diode. So the voltage drop on the diode plus the voltage drop on the resistor is enough to drive the transistor. So we do get the 600 millivolts. Now, although the circuit looks complicated, this should save us with a bit of extra power dissipation. So the circuit should work more efficiently. If we now try out how balanced the two currents are and re-simulate the initial type of circuit, we can see that we have only about a couple milliamps. So we still get our current balancing effect. So, seems simple enough, let's try it out. I made the necessary modifications, I added the extra current sink and diode to supply the emitters of the transistors, but I also added a small thinner diode just to get a bit of an offset voltage. I'll get back to that in a moment. And of course I brought out a fifth voltmeter because you can never have too many voltmeters and it's time to test the circuit. So I'm supplying it from 8 volts now. So previously we, we were using about 5 volts and my thinner has around a 3 volt voltage drop so that's why it's 8. And I would like to point out that I did not change the values of the resistors in the emitters. So we still have the 4.7 ohms and we can see that we have quite small currents this time. So we went down by about half with the current going through each of the channels. And this is because although we have the same resistor, we now have the extra offset. So if we do measure the offset, so the voltage dropping on our extra Schottky diode, we can see we have around 280 millivolts. And then if we measure what's on the emitter resistors, we can see another 280, 270 something. So in total, we have 540 millivolts, roughly 550 depending on the exact transistor, to stabilize the current going through each of our power transistors. And as we can see, we do have a bit of a spread in the currents, but it's nothing to worry about. The important thing is that we reduce the resistor through which most of this high current is passing through. Now, you may be thinking at this point, well, this is a nice circuit, but I need a negative supply voltage to get it to actually work. Well, not really. Let me give you an example. So, what I got here is an example of a high power output stage that uses this principle. So, we have our high power transistors, both high side and low side, double transistors both up and down. We have our differential supply, so this is quite common with this sort of amplifiers. You can use a single supply, but then you would have to couple the output through a capacitor or something, but that's a different story. And now each of the power transistors has their own resistor in the emitter, so to set the current limit and to stabilize the currents. And we also have the small low power transistors, and then the emitters of the small transistors are interconnected to the Schottky diode circuit. And these diodes are supplied from a current source and a current sink pair that both should run on the same current. So if we run the circuit and we look at the current going through the load, so I put few load values, the value is not really important, but we do see that with small currents you get a sine wave input and a sine wave output, but as you increase the current through the load you start to get a limit. So we have roughly 300 milliamps on the top, 280, and 350 on the bottom. So the two stages are not really matched properly because of the current source and the current sink pair. But if we analyze the circuit in a bit more detail, we can see that on our emitter resistors, we only get around 100 and something millivolts because the rest of the voltage needed to drive the small transistors is appearing on 
the Schottky diodes. So here we have an extra 350 millivolts. So basically we get the same effect of current stabilization with this 1 ohm resistor in the emitter as if we would have a 5 ohm resistor. Difference being that we have a much smaller voltage drop. So you can fiddle around with the circuit a bit, work on the resistor values and get the circuit to work at much higher currents. But one of the things to keep in mind though is that you don't want the current that can go into the bases of the transistors to be higher than the current going through the current source and sink pair. Because if that happens, then your reference voltage will start to fluctuate. So depending on what your needs are, there's quite simple and there's extremely complicated ways to get all your transistors running at the same currents. The exact method will depend on your exact application. So all in all, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.